So, the moderator for this session will be Darren. Um, from the National Competent Authority of Ireland. And he will uh, present all the different speakers. Please, Darren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ugis. Uh, good morning, everybody. Everybody's getting into position, so I'll just give a bit of a, a, a summary of, or a kind of a introduction into where we are. Um, so as discussed yesterday and again this morning, shortages are complex um, and there's no quick solution. So to date, many of us have been in a reactive phase, so it's always reacting to a situation. But what we're looking at in this situation is to try and pivot and move towards uh, a less reactive and more preventative phase. So that's the entire um, concept for, for this session. So it's on shortage prevention. Um, in my own agency, 20% of all shortages are prevented. Um, and that's due to the collaborative efforts of everyone. It's not one owner, as we have said yesterday and again today, it's not one owner, so not one solution. But um, when we do work together, we can we can look at trying to prevent even more um, shortages and lessen the impact on patients. So what we're going to try and look at today is a solution-focused approach to the prevention of shortages. So there's a lot of I'll refer to it as admiring the problem. What we will try to move to is actually looking at um, proposals for the prevention of shortages moving forward. So we'll hear from, um, and I'll introduce them separately as they're going up, So, but we'll hear from different perspectives from the patient and consumers, the pharmaceutical industry, healthcare professionals, including veterinary um, practitioners. Um, and Maria from the, from the EMA will also talk about the, the task force work plan. Um, and just a little bit of housekeeping, the audience questions, um, as with yesterday, we'll keep them when, to when everyone else has spoken. So, without any further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker. So, Ancela Santos is a Senior Health Policy Officer for European Consumer Organization and also a member of the EMA's Patient and Consumer Working Party. Okay, first of all, um, so many thanks to the EMA and the heads of medicines agencies for the invitation. For those uh, of you who are not familiar with BEUC, we are an umbrella group that brings together 46 consumer organizations from across 32 countries in Europe, and we work on a wide range of topics, including health. And um, so here in the area of health, one of our objectives is that consumers understood broadly as users of um, health products and services have access to affordable medicines when they need them. But this is becoming increasingly challenging uh, due to various reasons. One of them is uh, high drug pricing. But also in the last years, our members have been raising the alarm about the increasing number of notified uh, shortages, which, for example, in Spain multiplied by 12 in a decade. And our concerns in this area add to those expressed by patient groups, doctors, and pharmacists, as we will see later. So shortages impact a wide range of stakeholders, but clearly the main victims are those who need uh, to take the, the medicines. And in order to capture the full impact of shortages on consumers, our members did, um, in November 2020, surveys in Belgium, Spain, Italy, and Portugal. These countries followed a similar methodology, which is um, included at the end of this um, presentation. And then in December 2019, in our member in Norway also did uh, another survey. Um, and across countries, so we saw that between 20% and almost 50% of the respondents reported a situation of shortage in the previous um, two years. And this is what they found in relation to the impact of uh, shortages. So in around 9 in 10 cases, the medicine was prescribed, which indicates that it was obviously deemed uh, essential by a healthcare professional to treat the patient. And between a third and a half of the consumers said the shortage had an impact on their health. For many of those, um, shortages caused anxiety, uh, but shortages also led to a worsening of symptoms, which was the case on average for about 30% of the, 
of respondents in Belgium, Italy, Portugal, and Spain, amongst those who experienced a, a, a problem as a result of the shortage. Um, consumers also uh, reported suffering side effects from uh, alternative uh, treatments. They also reported medication errors. And as a result, some required um, sick leave and a few also had to be hospitalized. But in addition, shortages impact as well consumers' pockets, for example, because alternative treatments are more expensive or not reimbursed, um, which was the case between 12% and 14% of uh, people who faced a shortage in the four countries I, I mentioned before. And in Norway, one in four consumers who experienced a shortage had to travel to a different city or region to find their medicine, which also entails uh, costs. So clearly this shows that uh, we need better policies uh, to tackle shortages. At the EU level now uh, we have a regulation that extends the IMA mandate uh, to deal with uh, medicine availability in crisis situations and this is welcome. Um, but we need to do more and the situation of the shortages of antibiotics that we, we've seen across the EU also shows that we need more preventative measures. And the upcoming revision of the EU pharma legislation is an opportunity to move in that direction. And these are five things that we would like to see in the revised legislation. So first of all, we would like um, to see an obligation for companies across countries to do shortage prevention plans and to submit them with the authorities. So then the authorities can issue recommendations as necessary to strengthen the supply chain. We would also like to see an obligation for companies to have safety stocks, which can, can help and, and act as a caution. Um, as, for example, France has done uh, for medicines of major therapeutic interest, for which companies must have at least two months of stocks. And um, recently, the uh, representative of the medicines um, agency actually uh, mentioned in, a, in, a, in, a, in the media that uh, in the case of antibiotics, these safety stocks actually helped uh, to minimize a bit the, the impact of the increase in, in demand. We would also like to see um, stock monitoring um, systems uh, in all member states um, linked to the EMAs, the platform that will be also established. And we think it's important that we have earlier notification of shortages also from companies because this will allow competent authorities to manage also shortages better and minimize their impact on patients and consumers. All this needs to go hand in hand with dissuasive sanctions to push companies uh, to comply with supply obligations. And in addition, uh, we would like also to see um, Non-profit production uh, models, um, this was mentioned briefly yesterday. Uh, we think this is also important, uh, especially for medicines uh, for which companies uh, have no commercial interest. So this is clearly something that at the EU level um, we would like to see. Uh, and for example, HERA is, is a well-placed to do that, uh, but it could go also beyond um, HERA. And with this, I finish and I leave you here a bit the summary of the methodologies that our members used uh, for the consumer surveys. And I'll be happy to reply to any questions you may have during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, next up, from an industry perspective and speaking on behalf of all industry associations, um, so no small task there. Uh, Stefan Roniger. So, Stefan, over to you. Many thanks, Darren, for your kind introduction, and many thanks to EMA and the heads of agencies to invited industry to present. I'm pleased to present to you the industry consolidated view. Let me also reference to the material which we have in the backup slide, which demonstrates the individual aspects which are highlighted by the different participating associations, which you see here on the first slide. Next slide, please. Let me start by setting the scene in a way that industry stakeholders have demonstrated continuous improvement with the help, of course, of regulators to avoid a lot of shortages which are possible 
And we have seen just in the presentations this morning that the Irish Medicines Agency reported that they could prevent 20% of the shortages with discussions. And we prevented that it's getting worse due to a very much increasing demand in the different countries. When we talk about what we can do to prevent shortages, we must take note that there are different best practices needed depending on the product modality, on the stages in the supply chain, on the phases in the product life cycle, and of course, due to the patient population, if you have many patients or just a few, as we have for the orphan drugs. Next slide, please. We had been asked to give a feedback on the good practice guidance. We think that we must be aware that the stakeholders and the role of the supply chain is different. We ask if there can be one list of critical medicines among Europe and one reporting system across the EU. In this guidance, it's a great listing of the different stakeholders, but we think one very important stakeholder is missed, and this is the media. And also, we have to consider how every stakeholder can realize their influence in order to support a continuous supply. In this document, there is a nice graphic which gives the marketing authorization holder the overall responsibility. However, we think it cannot be done alone because how should the marketing authorization holder get all the information throughout the supply chain when the product was sold to the first economic customer? And it was mentioned several times also yesterday in the different sessions, how can industry achieve more visibility on the demand. Next slide. And this is actually the key question and the source for all of that towards the communication strategy. Who defines the demand? We need an appropriate forecasting so that we can plan. We have about one year and the vaccines are also for the other medicines to ramp up production. We have seen it very excellent now in the time with the vaccine, with the pandemic. It's possible. Industry can collaborate. We had vaccines from universities, from small companies. All had been marketed and all had been made available in the best case as they could use it. Therefore, we are asking to streamline and aligning regulatory processes to take what was developed during the pandemic and make use of these elements which matter for patients at the end to put patients in the middle. It's also about leveraging the flexible and agile regulatory framework and undo the burden on the marketing authorization holders only. This can be done by optimizing interconnected multi-stakeholder procedures and interactions. Further details you may see in the presentation on the communication strategy in one of the next sessions. Next slide. What has been done by industry and what are the planned initiatives? We are securing and diversifying the global supply chains in order to enhance an internal and contracted manufacturing footprint also all over Europe. Drug shortage prevention plans are established for the manufacturers and the question is how can we use one template which can be applied all over Europe, of course a different one per stages in the supply chain. And especially how can we focus on critical medicine and only share this one with the regulators? It's about focusing on risk, 
where it matters most for the patient and not just submit data and data and data where no knowledge is gained from. Furthermore, the best practice tools are available, trained and maintained, and they focus on system-specific and product-specific elements. Next slide. Overall, we call to move from stakeholder-focused to patient-centered thinking for a holistic, multi-stakeholder approach for transparency, for science and risk-based approaches to be used in the requirements so that each stakeholder shall realize their influence and work solution-oriented towards the patient-centered outcome. And all about the supply chain, from the manufacturers using the different starting materials over the marketing authorization holder, wholesaler distribution and healthcare professionals, governed by governance. All of them have to play a role, including media. And all of that should be fit for purpose. Many thanks for your attention and looking forward for any questions you may have. Thanks so much. Thank you, Stefan. So next up, we have uh, Jorge Batista, who is Professional Affairs Advisor for the Pharmaceutical Group of the European Union and is also a member of the Healthcare Professional Working Party of the EMA. Jorge, over to you. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank EMA for the opportunity to present here the community pharmacy's contribution to the prevention of medicine shortages. So I'm here speaking on behalf of PGU, which is the organization that represents community pharmacists in Europe. We have uh, 32 member countries that cover not only countries from the European Union, but also some non-EU countries that goes beyond a bit of the EU remit. So, of course, medicine shortages are a big part of the uh, work of community pharmacies, unfortunately. And I say this because every year we run a survey asking what is the impact of medicine shortages at the community pharmacy perspective. So, these, so last year, in 2022, over the last few weeks of the year, we run the survey and we got uh, 29 responses, so not only from EU, EA, but also non-EU countries. And I'm here also to present a bit of the um, main findings of this survey. So what you learn is that over the last 12 months, every country that was surveyed experienced medicine shortage. And when we see to ask, so did it uh, get better? The, the situation did it worse, uh, how was it? We learned that in 76% of the cases it actually got worse and only in 24% percentage of the cases uh, of the countries it uh, stayed the same. Contrary of the um, expression of the years before that we saw a bit of a tendency to, in to um, improve the situation. So overall we saw that the situation in 2022 decreased and worsened compared to the years before. We asked them to, to learn a bit more what type of uh, medicines were in short supply. So we listed here on the ATC. Um, cardiovascular medications and nervous system ranked uh, first and second in the top medicines on short supply. This was uh, nothing surprising compared to the previous year. But this year, what you learn is that uh, over the last weeks of the year, that when the data was collected, we saw that anti-effectives for systemic use, also known as antibiotics, were already ranked third in the list of medicines in short supply. This, compared to the previous year, was um, already a wake-up uh, call, let's say, um, because before um, antibiotics were also missing, we're also in short supply, but further down the table. And then we went to understand, okay, medicines are in short supply, but how many can we quantify? And then um, uh, we asked our members and uh, the majority of the members actually replied that over 600 medicines were in short supply, um, which compared to the previous years, yet again, shows a worsening of the situation. And of course, medicines impact patients, impact the healthcare system, impact pharmacist practice, and we went to learn more how it, uh, how, what impact it has concretely on the patients. And uh, uh, compared to the previous speakers, and the Ansel already showed a bit of a similar survey uh, and the impact on patients. And indeed, in 93% of the cases, medicine shortages cause distress and inconvenience for the patients. 
and roughly 90% interruption of treatments because of medicines are in short supply. Because in some cases uh, other medicines need to be dispensed, increased copayments were also um, present in 72% of the countries, and also this might lead to suboptimal treatment as new medicines need to be changed because of those that were in short supply not being able to be dispensed to the patient. This led in 34% of the cases to medication errors and in smaller cases also to adverse events and even cases of death were recorded in uh, over the European Union. So, of course, we understand that it has a big impact for patients, for community pharmacies, for the whole healthcare system in, in general and on average in Europe, each pharmacy uh, team spends uh, circa seven hours per week dealing with medicine shortages and this is a, a, a number of hours that has been increasing throughout the time. And we went on to, uh, to ask, so if pharmacies can actually report early uh, signs of medicine shortages. So if uh, countries are able uh, to report uh, short supplies of medicines from the community pharmacy's perspective, and in 15 out of the 26 countries, and here 26 countries, we only put EU plus EEA countries, in 15 of them, pharmacies are able to report medicine shortages. However, it's only mandatory in three of the countries. So concretely, Portugal, Italy, and Poland. In those countries that pharmacies are able to report, they are able to report um, prescription-only medicines in all of the countries, so in 15, non-prescription medicines in 13 of the countries, and also medical devices in just a third of them. We then ask, okay, so this information that is reported uh, by pharmacists, this goes into a repository. Usually this repository was managed by the National Competent Authority, but then we ask, okay, so from the moment on that pharmacists are, ab are able to report, will they be able to access the information? And we saw that the, um, they are, I mean, in some of the countries, so in 12 countries in, in general, they're able to access the information. Sometimes it's through a public access, th sometimes through a private, private access, but still of the 21 countries that responded, nine do not have access to this repository of information. Also, we learned that in the 26 countries, EU plus EEA, 19, in 19 of them, pharmacists are able to access the uh, reporting system for shortages. <clears throat> I'm very good at the, uh, it's very good that the, the moderator of this session today is from Ireland, as I bring here a best practice example from uh, uh, HPRA, which together with the pharmacists and the wholesalers were able to dedicates time to create the medicine shortages framework to help again to avert potential shortages from occurring. Also this coordination uh, um, action um, leads to the management of potential and actual shortages as they arise. So they are able also to deal it in real time. Same in Spain, we have an example from the uh, Consejo, which is the uh, Spanish uh, General Pharmaceutical Council, which is the Spanish member of PGU. They created the Information Center on Supply of Medicine called SysMed, and this is a system that automatically sends to the pharmacies to the regional councils when there are short supplies of medicine. So it means that in real time we can have the information on, on shortages. Also, this uh, um, example led to um, a new project, um, the, a, a pilot project done by four different countries, Italy, Spain, France and uh, Portugal in order to increase and to make this system as dynamic as possible. Also here in the Netherlands, our uh, country that receives us today, uh, we have Pharmanco that is uh, managed by KNMP, the Royal Dutch Pharmacies Association. That is a system that is open to report uh, shortages from manufacturers, from wholesalers, pharmacies, other healthcare professionals and patients as well. And this allows for public access to the information that is available to everyone. Also in Portugal, another example, the National Association of Pharmacies has a system that automatically records every order that is failed uh, to supply, for example, by the wholesalers to the pharmacies, and it triggers information that is then fed into a report. This report is done uh, four times a year, and then it's also shared with the National Competent Authority, Infarmed, and this is a voluntary and complementary system to the one uh, that the NCA uh, has, in order also to uh, understand the mismatches on, or where the demand or the supply are met. 
Finally, last best practice example, we bring you the French example from the Dossier Pharmaceutique Ruptur. So basically, all the supply chain actors came together and yet again in, in a multi-professional um, and transcommunication strategy, they created the Dossier Pharmaceutique Ruptur, which is a, a, a platform able to notify the shortages that are uh, connected through a software in the community pharmacy. So 93% of the community pharmacies are linked. And then the pharmaceutical companies are able to respond to these messages to shortages related to their products. And it covers 84% of the products on the market. And then 98% of the wholesalers are also connected to this platform and they can access the system to check responses, notification and also provide information to companies. The French, the French um, medicines agency, so the National Competent Authority, can also access and supervise the exchange only uh, in the case for anticipated shortages that pertain to medicines of major therapeutic interest. Finally, we see some of uh, good examples and best practices that uh, I already share here. And we, PGU, we understand that we are in a position um, to uh, change the system as, uh, for example, with the revision of the general pharmaceutical legislation, but, but not only. So there are a few policy recommendations that we issue. Um, so first of all, ensuring uh, availability of medicines, of course, through compliance of EU and national legislation. Widening professional competence, of course, uh, pharmacies, professional competence is uh, uh, national competence. Um, but we see that uh, um, enlarging the scope of practice and actually the leverage tools and legal tools that pharmacies uh, have at their disposal to deal with medicine shortages. For example, uh, um, therapeutic substitution, generic substitution, and so on. Also, improving transparency, reporting, early monitoring, and the communication on medicine shortages, as we saw that it's key to engage with other stakeholders to uh, prevent shortages through an early uh, signaling and early monitoring, and of course, through compensation of financial impact of medicines uh, uh, shortages uh, throughout the uh, healthcare system. And I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I remain available for any questions you might have during the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, next up, from a veterinary perspective, we have Nancy De Bruyne, who is the Executive Director at the Federation for Veterinarians of Europe. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the European Medicines Agency and the HMA for organizing this very important workshop and also especially for making it one health, so including healthcare professionals, both from the human sector but also from the veterinary sector, as most of the products that we use are similar. We use the same active ingredients mostly. So it is important to look at this uh, from a One Health perspective. So just to give a little bit of background for, for those of you that don't know the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe, we are the umbrella organization of um, 45 national veterinary associations and, and they come from 38 European countries, so we're wider than the EU. Um, and in total, we represent about 300,000 veterinarians. Um, veterinarians work in a lot of different sectors, so most people, if they think about veterinarians, they think about practitioners uh, for companion animals or for livestock, but there are also a lot of veterinarians who work in, in government, um, in education, in research, and so on. And, and as FE, we, we represent all these veterinarians. So uh, if we have a, just a little bit a step back and, and we look at, at um, the human uh, sector, the human medicine sector versus the veterinary medicine sector, like I said, we are very similar because we use mostly the same products, but we're also different. Uh, and it's important to recognize these differences. Um, so first of all, a very big difference is the number of species we have. Um, in human medicine, you have one species, people, humans. Um, in veterinary medicine, we have a lot. Uh, we have seven major species, dogs, cats, and all the livestock. But we have many more, um, going from reptiles to dogs, cats, to cows, to elephants. And, and medicines are 
uh, veterinary medicines are authorized per species. And most of them are also authorized in a country. We have EU authorized medicines, but they're, they're only limited. Most are authorized nationally. So this is, yeah, you see there are a lot of species. We need a lot of medicines. The second big difference is the market size and who pays for the medicines. Uh, if we look at the market size for human medicines versus veterinary medicine, it's about 97% for human medicine and only 3% for veterinary. So it's a very small market. And in human medicine, you have the social security system, you have insurances. In veterinary medicine, it's mostly the owner that has to pay for the medicine. Um, so especially for livestock uh, species, every cent is, is counting. Um, we, we cannot have too expensive medicines. And then the last difference is, is that some of the animals we treat, we also eat. So we have to make sure that the, if we use medicines on them, that, that is, is safe uh, for, for food uh, and consumer safety. So we have a lot of extra testing to be done uh, for the uh, uh, medicines we use for food producing animals to make sure that they are safe from a food perspective, for a consumer's perspective, and also for an environmental perspective. So all of that leads that we have a very limited market, or, um, and especially in, in small for minor species, so species we do not uh, treat a lot. So I think then of, of fish, of turkeys, and so on. We don't have a lot of medicines. And also uh, we have a big problem in small countries because the market isn't big enough uh, for companies to, to make it commercially viable. So we have a huge problem with lack of availability in veterinary medicine. Also, uh, similar to the previous speakers, we also did a survey uh, among our members um, to prepare for this meeting, um, because what is very clear to us um, on the human perspective, on the human side, you are much further in monitoring shortages than, than we are on the veterinary side. Um, as you heard earlier, there's, hard, there's only a few countries that have legal obligation to report uh, shortages, and, and all the rest is more voluntary. So we don't know really the extent of the shortage problem in veterinary medicine. So for that reason, we also did a survey with our members um, and we got a lot of replies. Um, and one of the things we noticed is, is for our veterinary practitioners, sometimes they mixed up between what is a shortage, a production problem or a supply chain issue so that the medicine is temporary unavailable, whether what is a lack of availability. Because for them, in the end, it's the same. They have a, a, an animal who has a problem and they don't have a medicines to treat it. So they sometimes uh, saw it as, I'm short off. So if we look, we, yeah, you, don't, you cannot see it, but it, we got a long list back uh, from all the different countries on, on the sort of medicines that they're missing um, at this moment and, and where there are uh, shortages. And um, what we saw from that is, first of all, we saw that some of these uh, medicines missing were the same in the different countries. So this was really more EU-wide, while other ones were specifically for a country. So they were not available in one country, but they were available in the neighboring countries. And then if we looked at what type of products were, uh, were they, uh, did they have, were they short of, the, f uh, the antibiotics and vaccines came as the most, the most uh, common one. And for antibiotics, this was really mostly almost only, the, the narrow spectrum antibiotics, so the penicillins, the amoxicillins. And this is, of course, very bad because if you don't have these available, you need to use a more broad spectrum antibiotic. antibiotic and that's the last thing we want um, in respect for IMR. 
in vaccines, a lot of vaccines shortages were seen across the species. Part of the problem may be because some of the vaccine manufacturing sites were changed into manufacturing sites for COVID and it, vaccines, and it takes a time to move them back to animal health vaccines. So to conclude, we have a big problem with availability and shortages just make this problem worse. Um, and, and so we earlier yesterday, it was a discussion about an essential list uh, for human medicine. I think very much we need the same thing for veterinary medicine, an essential list for veterinary medicine, and also to look where we have the biggest therapeutic gaps, where we have major indication um, for diseases that we don't have any medicines to treat them with. So in veterinary medicine, we just had a new regulation. On the human side, you're just starting to process um, with the pharmaceutical reform, but we had our new regulation adopted a year ago. And one of the um, aims of this new legislation was to increase the availability of veterinary medicinal products and the functioning of the internal market. So one of the goals, of course, that was for us the most important if, uh, of these. Now, in the new legislation, we also have a lot of provisions that can increase this availability, such as more uh, flexibility for the prescribing of label, stimulating innovation, uh, better da longer data protection periods, and so on. And most of all, also the union product database. So this is a, a database developed by the European Medicines Agency that have all medicines, veterinary medicines licensed nationally and centrally, bring them all together um, and that, can, that everybody can look up. So a lot of tools to increase availability. On the other hand, we also see that there's a lot of barriers towards that. Um, shortages is one of them, but lack of incentives for investments, more national restrictions, more stringent regulatory frameworks, and so on. They all influence this and they, they make that, that in the end, maybe we don't see availability going up. And this is something I think we really should more monitor um, in the veterinary field. And I don't know, maybe this is also an issue in the human field. Is availability really increasing? So it is important to monitor that and also to have indicators on how you can monitor that. Um, so how can we prevent shortages? Um, well, we can prevent them, first of all, we think, by better collaboration and communication. Um, collaboration on a European level, uh, but also on a national level. And earlier we, we saw the four examples um, that were given uh, by, by the PGEU colleague of the four countries, where really true collaboration uh, between the competent authority, marketing authorization, and healthcare professionals, they were able to prevent and, and um, help uh, shortages. This is for us, I think, the most important. Another one is communication. Yesterday, it was mentioned that European uh, that uh, human healthcare professionals do not always get enough communication on shortages, and this was exactly the same answer we got from our veterinarians. They what they often do not know why is a product not available, how long is it not available, and what alternatives can they use. So communication, better communication toward healthcare professionals is really um, crucial. And facilitating the single market, if there's a product not available in one country, but it is available in the countries next door, we should facilitate a single market and have a fair uh, distribution of the products. In, with, on the veterinary sector, like it was said before, we are very small. Adding red tape, add, adding extra bureaucracy, we believe, will not help. It could lead to more products being taken from the market. Uh, and that's the last thing we want. Um, and then my very last plea, if you make essential lists, 
for human medicine, whether for peacetime or for uh, healthcare cases, please also think about the veterinary side, because some of the products you can put on that list that can be, become restricted for animals, and that can have really huge consequences also for public health, because many of these products are not only important for the animals, but also for public health, because many of the diseases are so anotic, so transmit from animals to people and the other way around. Thank you for your attention and very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Nancy. I have to say, I have dispensed an awful lot of medication for horses, but I, I can't imagine what an elephant would look like. Um, so the last before we take the questions and answers is, or the discussion, should I say, is uh, Maria Jesus Alcaraz Tomas from the EMA. She's a medicine and medical device shortage specialist and also co-chair of the thematic working group one of the task force. Thanks, Maria. Thank you, Darren. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so um, I will um, talk about the, the work plan. Um, some of the messages I have in my presentation were presented yesterday. So I will go very quickly some, some slides and, and give some time for the Q&A session. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll skip the introduction because uh, we received the information yesterday uh, and I will go quickly through the work program. So different activities of the task force uh, for the prevention of shortages, but with a special focus on good practice guidance on prevention of shortages. So um, for both industry and healthcare professionals and patients organizations. So uh, I'll skip this one. Um, so we are all aware of, um, of the problem of shortages. This is a long-standing uh, problem in the EU and has been in the agenda of industry, regulators, uh, EU bodies for some time now. And uh, as mentioned yesterday by the EMA executive director, uh, we are shifting the approach to shortages from um, reactive um, perspective uh, to a more uh, proactive and um, preventive uh, approach to tackle shortages. Uh, so the task force, uh, the work program of, of, the, of the task force, and uh, especially for uh, activities in, linked to the prevention of shortages, are mainly um, built on three main um, pillars, so um, the identification of root causes and its analysis, and the implementation of strategies to prevent shortages, the interaction with the stakeholders, this has been uh, repeated, we need to interact with all actors of the supply chain and, 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 and tackle the, 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 this uh, multifactorial problem, and, and of course, as mentioned, uh, I, I think by its uh, speaker, um, activities related to communication to, to prevent some shortages. Uh, as you know, the task force, uh, both uh, medicines for human use and veterinary uh, medicinal products uh, are under the scope of the task force. So we also have activities in, in the field of uh, the veterinary section uh, to, to prevent shortages. And we cannot forget, forget also the international, the global um, in, in, in line of the of the shortages, uh, so we have activities to increase harmonization not only within the UEA but also uh, with international partners. As mentioned in, uh, at the beginning in, of the presentation, uh, we will focus the. Um, the, the presentation on, on the guidance on, on prevention, but uh, we don't want to forget other important activities of the task force um, to prevent shortages. Uh, and I would like just to, uh, to give some uh, flavor here on, on activities, but you can find all the information both on the EMA and HMA webpage. So uh, the, the complete work program is, is there, available. Uh, so, um, one of the actions is uh, the analysis of recommendations listed on the European Commission report on the root causes of shortages and, and to identify possible preventing uh, activities. We have also one activity for vets here, 
and, and is uh, the analysis of, of the results of this study and, and, uh, and to identify um, or to explore if the root causes of shortages are similar for shortages uh, of uh, bed medicines and if actions for human uh, medicines could be adapted for, for the bed section as well. Uh, we also uh, had um, an, an activity uh, and the task force uh, sent a proposal to change the legislation to improve prevention and management of shortages. Uh, this proposal was circulated to the European Commission um, on the 31st of, of March, so this action is um, completed now. Uh, we also have some activities uh, to, uh, to conduct uh, pilot projects to implement guidance. Uh, so the first one, uh, you may remember in, uh, in the workshop in 2018, uh, that the, it was agreed the, the guidance for industry um, for the identification and, and reporting of shortages. And it was agreed to have uh, a pilot to implement that, that guidance. Uh, so, unfortunately, COVID-19 came and the activities of the task force were put on hold, but this was picked up as one of the activities uh, to, 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 to be resumed as, as soon as possible. Uh, so, when we started with this, uh, the implementation of this pilot, um, we, we, we saw that um, um, the situation has been uh, changed a lot during the COVID-19 situation, and many um, national competent authorities already had implemented the, 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 the guidance, and they had uh, templates and, and systems uh, for the reporting of shortages. So it was agreed that at this point in, in time, uh, it wasn't needed. Uh, and, and the action was was uh, was cancelled. The other pilot is for the implementation of the metric um, guidance, and this will uh, come. Com, um, we will take this this action um, in the next uh, few years. Uh, and finally, I would also like to mention the implementation guide to harmonize criteria to improve the management of shortages and and their prevention. Uh, here I'm presenting on, on behalf of Thematic Working Group 2. So um, I would like to start with the good practice guidance for patients and healthcare professionals organizations. Uh, this guidance was published in July last year and was uh, developed, uh, was drafted by Thematic Working Group uh, 2 with um, um, a working group with, of um, healthcare professionals and, and patients representatives, and, and uh, the, the drafting uh, took into account uh, activities or best practices already available at national level, and the, um, the aim of, of, the, of this uh, practice is to enhance practice for, for prevention, to increase visibility of existing practices, and, and to foster interaction and to improve information exchange uh, between the, the different stakeholders. So the guidance provides high-level recommendations uh, that maybe uh, they are addressed either to healthcare professionals organizations or patients organizations or to both of them. Uh, so um, one of the recommendations is to establish a shortage a observatories um, by healthcare professionals and, and patients organizations or to link um, the, the information to, to link uh, the, the availability of these uh, observatories to collect information and to identify uh, early signals um, in, the, in the supply chain. Uh, another recommendation uh, was to work with national competent authorities uh, to uh, develop key messages uh, regarding shortages and, and to conduct education um, campaigns and guidance um, to, to raise awareness um, on shortages, root causes, uh, and also guidances uh, to um, ensure a safe use of alternatives. Or, or, or to have uh, those uh, sparing, uh, sparing measures when, when uh, the availability of medicines is um, restricted. 
um, the importance to have better access to, to data and to promote uh, awareness among all healthcare professionals and, and, and patients about shortages, uh, development or risk assessment for medicines with high in clinical, uh, clinical impact, and, and also um, to develop guidances on safe compounding of medicines uh, when there is a shortage and there are not uh, available alternatives in, on the market. Um, for this guidance, uh, some activities uh, are including um, in, in the in the work program uh, to 2025. Uh, so the um, the guidance was um, after the the publication of the guidance, there was a, a review of of practices, and it was identified that um, or, or the initial uh, feedback uh, showed that there is. Um, limited awareness about this uh, guidance and its implementation and, and, the, and, and it was discussed with patients and healthcare professional representatives how to raise awareness and how to implement and how to promote the implementation of this guidance. Um, one of the um, activities mentioned by healthcare professionals and um, and, and patients organizations uh, was the possibility uh, to have um, to allow the possibility um, to report in shortages to EMA by patients and healthcare professionals organizations at EU level. Of course, these activities are in place at national level, so uh, this is well established. And also EMA also collects information uh, from healthcare pro professionals and, and patients organizations, but it's a, a doc solution and not a um, establish a um, formal um, a channel to, to receive this information. So we um, use that information to collect information on, uh, we, we use these uh, chan channels to collect information uh, for the impact on availability as a consequence of the war in Ukraine or during COVID-19. Um, so it was agreed to launch uh, a pilot uh, to explore the, the added value of of this uh, report from EU patients and healthcare professionals organizations at EU level, uh, so the communication directly to, to EMA. And the scope of, the, of this uh, pilot is uh, shortages affecting one or more, or, or more uh, EU member states and where the, this medicinal product involved is, is considered critical. And, and this is for the so-called peace time or preparedness, and, and also uh, for public health emergencies uh, to collect any information that could indicate an upcoming shortage with the aim to identify uh, early signals. So the pilot started in, in December 2022. Uh, we have received uh, information from five associations, and we have received more than 23 uh, reports on, on active substances. Uh, most of the uh, reports uh, we have received are um, shortages already known or long-standing uh, shortages issues um, but um, but we are working now um, on the evaluation of, of the reports received and the activities we have to uh, to implement, and uh, the pilot uh, will be uh, evaluated in in June twenty. Uh, in 2023. So in this case, uh, the, the revaluation uh, will allow us to, to make a decision on the uh, utility of this pilot and will be presented. And now I would like to move to the good practice for industry and prevention of shortages of medicinal products for human use. Uh, so um, um, the, the scope of the of the of this uh, guidance is to provide good practices uh, to all uh, to uh, to to prevent shortages uh, and to reduce the likelihood of shortages, uh, taking into account all actors involved in the in the supply chain. Uh, so it is mainly focused on recommendations on how to mitigate it on how to prevent shortages, but it also includes recommendations on how to mitigate a shortage uh, when, when it uh, already happened. Uh, so um, 
It describes in the scope the uh, most common reasons for shortages. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, and it, it doesn't include um, commercial activities, uh, pricing or uh, reimbursement uh, policies, and, 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 clinical, um, and clinical guidance for, for, treat, uh, for, treat and for treatment of, of patients in, in the event of, of a shortage. Um, it also describe, describes the, the key players and, and the roles uh, of these players in the supply chain. And um, the guidance contains uh, 10 recommendations. So um, they are divided in uh, optimization of current systems and, uh, and prevention and mitigation strategies. So for the first part, we have uh, three uh, recommendations, and it doesn't come to a surprise as uh, we have already um, listened to other speakers yesterday and earlier today, uh, the need to increase communication, the importance to have timely, uh, timely uh, notification in order to allow uh, time to react and prepare for, for shortages. And this has also uh, raised by, by Ansela before. The importance, uh, the recommendation to increase uh, transparency, uh, to so just to increase um, communication and knowledge sharing. Um, and also here, also the, the importance to have uh, transparency, transparency with international partners and taking into account uh, the global uh, dimension of shortages, and, and also uh, a recommendation to increase the accuracy uh, of uh, key information when it's provided to NCAs, and to provide uh, information as soon as possible, and then to complement if not all the information is available at the time of the notification. Uh, for the prevention and mitigation uh, strategies, um, uh, one of the recommendations is um, uh, to, to develop uh, shortages prevention plans and to include this uh, in, the, um, uh, in the pharma quality system. Um, the next one is the shortage management plan and so the availability to respond to, to shortages when they have already occurred and, and also um, to pilot the effectiveness of, of, of these uh, activities. Um, the next um, recommendation is the uh, optimi optimization of the pharma, uh, pharmaceutical quality system to strengthen uh, reliability and resilience of the supply chain uh, so to um, uh, to to support uh, a continuous improvement of the system and and, and here also uh, the importance to include the the evaluation of the robustness of the supply chain and and the controls in place uh, to manage shortages uh, we also have another recommendation to increase resilience in the supply chain um, uh, and here taking into account uh, vulner vulnerabilities uh, uh, already uh, identified, uh, also the possibility to, uh, to have contingency uh, stocks, and, and this has also uh, mentioned by, uh, by Ansela um, earlier uh, today. The importance to the recommendation to improve uh, communication um, among all the stakeholders involved, um, the promotion uh, to promote a fair and equitable distribution. Um, and in this case, uh, we know uh, some activities for stockpiling uh, can uh, precipitate or prolong uh, shortages and can uh, have an impact on um, an equitable uh, distribution of, in, of medicinal products to, to, to patients. And here, um, the importance to, uh, for marketing authorization holders uh, to take into account in the, um, for the fair uh, distribution um, the patient's cl clinical uh, needs in, in member states when, when there is a, um, a shortage and there is a need to uh, allocate the, the stock. And then the, the last uh, recommendation uh, is uh, to take um, steps to minimize the, the risk of parallel trade or export and um, to avoid exacerbating shortages in, in, sourcing, in sourcing countries. 
Uh, for I just wanted to highlight how was the drafting process. Uh, so uh, the the guidance was, was drafted by thematic working group one two, uh, sorry two one, and it was consulted. We had a consultation process with um, uh, group two, and after that uh, um, uh, it was presented to the steering committee of the task force, and we had the opportunity to present uh, the the good practices. Uh, to industry associations in, in a meeting we had in September 2022. So we received uh, here uh, initial feedback for, for, from industry associations, and after that, um, the formal consultation uh, was launched in, in October, and we received comments uh, from, we, we received replies from six um, industry associations and comments from, from five uh, associations which were uh, evaluated and, 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 and we will reply to all of them. So as, um, as uh, just to give you a snapshot of some of the comments we have received in the, um, during the written consultation. Uh, so we received um, several comments regarding the scope of the um, um, of the guidance, so we received comments um, regarding the impact on shortages um, for linked to pricing and, and, and reimbursement, uh, the lack of afford affordability as a, um, to, to causing uh, shortages and, and commercial reasons. We also received um, comments regarding the importance to have uh, in the guidance, um, other uh, actors of the supply chain, so shortages of uh, raw materials, APIs, excipients, and other components, and the impact on the uh, on, on the shortage of the medicinal product. But the guidance is mainly uh, in focus on um, shortages of medicinal products, so finished product, and and the importance of communication uh, with all the um, producers or uh, is included uh, and strengthened uh, as communication activities. So these uh, activities were already included. Uh, we also received comments uh, to increase harmonization. Uh, so proposals of definition of shortages, the importance to harmonize reporting of shortages, uh, several comments uh, regarding the um, shortage prevention and management plan, uh, so questions regarding the scope of the um, of these uh, SPMPs, um, uh, which, um, for which um, medicinal products, or so for critical medicinal products, or for all critical, or for all uh, of them, and also uh, the importance to to define uh, what a critical medicine is. We also received comments uh, for regarding roles and responsibilities, uh, so um, from wholesalers and, and parallel traders, and we also received information re um, as a feedback of the importance uh, of the implement implementation of the regulatory flexibilities during COVID-19 and the success of these uh, regulatory flexibilities to avoid shortages. Um, the use of uh, electronic product information um, to, um, uh, as one of the um, um, tools to, um, to address shortages and the importance of digital transformation and, and to have a look at the regulatory system. Uh, so here I would like to finish with next steps of the, of the, of the guidance. Uh, so we had a, an activity uh, at, the, at the task force to develop best practice guide on prevention and management of shortages of medicinal products for veterinary use. And we now uh, know that after the session uh, held yesterday, um, this action uh, has been um, identified as, no, as not needed. So we will update our, our, our work program to reflect this um, this action. Um, 
um, we will have a joint good practice uh, guidance for both healthcare professionals and patients organizations and industry. Uh, so we will work on, on this MERT uh, document in, in the future. And we have uh, another action, uh, and I put it here as a future actor action uh, for the shortage prevention plan. Uh, but uh, here we need to wait for the commission uh, proposal to modify the legislation to understand better the, the proposal, and then um, uh, we can work together uh, for, this, the, for this action. Uh, so I think this is the last one, and I would like to thank you uh, for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Okay, so I'd like to open the floor to uh, questions. Um, I see hands up already. That's great. I'll be taking questions. <laughs> I'll be I'll be There's hecklers as well. I'll be taking questions uh, both from the audience, from online, and then there's some received through chat as well. So we'll alternate between all of them. The first hand I saw up, and again, just from uh, continuing yesterday, if you could say your name, what you who you represent, and then the question. So go ahead. Thank you, Casper Ernest, Affordable Medicines Europe. Um, I was just a little bit unclear to me in regards to next steps. Uh, can you just clarify when you expect the guide to be finalized? Whether it will be, it was not entirely clear if you will find it or how you will change the scope or something. Uh, sorry, but. Uh, thank you for, for the question. Um, the guidance uh, is, um, we discussed yesterday um, in the steering committee and, and, and here uh, we will, um, the next steps is uh, we were waiting for feedback from today's session to finalize the, the guidance and we uh, will finalize the guidance and reply to all comments we have received. Uh, so um, I cannot give you a specific timelines for that, but um, I don't expect it will take long. Go ahead, lady in the back. Yep. Uh, my name is Jane Nicholson, and um, I represent the European Industrial Pharmacists. Um, I have a question for both, I think, Buick and for PGU. Um, in your surveys, did you define shortages as a shortage occurs when a product does not meet the demand at national level? Um, was that your definition? or Because um, it, it seems to me that we should be concentrating on critical medicines shortages and um, not, for example, shortages is a shortage because the product can't be obtained by the community pharmacist at the price that it will be, in re that it will be reimbursed at at the National Health Authority level. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Indeed, in the PGU survey, we have a disclaimer. So uh, we, for this purpose, uh, we um, use the meaning of shortage as any temporary unavailability of a medicine that is not able to be dispensed by the community pharmacy to the patient upon the prescription. And it usually involves any kind of substitution to any other uh, medical alternative. So what we also learn in the survey is that um, not every country has a common definition or agreed definition of medicine shortage. So we give this medicine shortage definition as a tool, as an umbrella, let's say, to uh, reply to the survey with, with their eye. So taking into consideration this uh, um, shortage uh, definition. But it's indeed something that uh, should be, and we advocate for that as well, is to have a common, defined, um, common definition uh, and a great definition of shortage. Yes, for the surveys done by our members. Um, so in four countries, Italy, Portugal, Spain, and Belgium, they asked if in the last two years um, the, the person or someone in their household had gone to a pharmacy or to a hospital and to get a medicine and was told that it would not be available in less than 24 hours due to lack of stock. So that was very clear. And in Norway, they also asked is if the person um, uh, had 
uh, was not able, had not been able to buy a medicine for themselves or, or on behalf of others in the last two years. And if this was due to supply issues to pharmacies, so it was also relying on the feedback they got from pharmacies. Um, so it excludes situation, the situation that you mentioned, that uh, medicine is not available because it's not reimbursed. It's really like out of stock uh, or supply issues reported also by pharmacies. Thank you, Angela. I'm just going to look at one of the first questions that came in through the chat. And it's interesting because there was a lot of discussion about transparency and communication and the impact of that. So it's a slightly different perspective on it from Maria online, which is interesting point on the media involvement. Could Stefan provide more insight on the expected role of media in terms of shortage prevention? Many thanks for this question. It's actually a very, very good one because we found out that in the EMA guidance, that element was absolutely not tackled. The example is what happened, for instance, in Germany, where a syrup for children was out of stock. And everybody went then to the pharmacy and wanted to have this syrup, which of course made the shortage a little bit bigger because nobody really needed for patients. It was just that each of the families want to raise their own stock. And this is an example, I know we should not prevent media from reporting that, and I think they are good, making a good job to making this point really practical and demonstrate that it's an issue. However, we should also take into account that each stakeholder, including media, should be aware what they can do and how they do uh, the situation, make the situation much worse depending how they react and how they uh, propose something. There can also be some preventive measure and says, yes, okay, uh, maybe wait a mini uh, another two weeks and then it's back again. It can be, and it was presented here by two of the surveys, which actually was very good to see that it's available in another, in another city or that it's in available in another country. Medicine can be there, and it's also yesterday it's the same issue came up in the workshop uh, for the veterinary medicines to make a difference between a medicine is not available, or how should I say, not um, if it's a shortage, which means it's not getting from the pharmacy if somebody goes to the pharmacy and gets the product. Lorraine? Thank you very much, Darren, and um, I'm Lorraine Nolan. I'm the Chief Executive of the HPRA and the Irish Agency. I do really want to come in on this point on media because I was very much so struck between the linkage between Ansela's presentation where you had said about the fact that shortages cause patients quite severe anxiety and Stefan's presentation where you had said the role of media and how does every stakeholder realise their influence. And I really think that is a key question. And I'm probably going to sound a little bit critical in the example that I'm going to give here, but I kind of have to do it to get to the point. But we have really seen over the winter surge period, and particularly with the shortages of uh, amoxicillin, where there was repeated and sustained coverage in the media on the shortage, but it was actually driven by industry because the media can only cover the stories they are fed. And the context that was taken in this situation, it was used as an opportunity to really raise pricing and reimbursement. And while I know that is a challenge and it is a contributory factor to shortages, but in the circumstances we were dealing with, it wasn't. And it really, really caused huge anxiety. It caused stockpiling. It caused overprescribing. At the public health end, uh, it made the situation much more difficult to manage. Our role as a regulator, we have a limited amount of capacity in this area and shortages. It became a huge exercise of trying to manage a very acute supply situation, but also manage the media from that as well too. So, you know, we are speaking a lot about partnership over, over this these two days, and it is absolutely key, but with partnership comes responsibility. So I think the question, Stefan, you asked around how do we use our influence and media together, it, it is a question of how do we all take that responsibility and work together in circumstances like that and how do we take it forward. So I think, you know, the lessons that we all have to learn from circumstances moving forward, that to me is a key question because I think there is a time and a place in media for certain, you know, coverage and certainly in acute situations, 
we really do have to think of the impact on patients and work together in those circumstances. Thanks, Lorraine. Charlotte. Thank you. Charlotte Rovian from France Asso Santé, French patient organization. I, I wanted to come back shortly on, on this question of transparency and communication, which is clearly key for patients. And I understand uh, the point uh, made by uh, Lauren. Um, but what I believe is that um, so the, the risk of stockpiling, which, which has been mentioned uh, a number of times with respect to the shortage of antibiotics, and we're, we're talking about uh, uh, prescribed medicine. So, so obviously patients don't go to the medicine just to buy tons of uh, antibiotics. Um, what the better way, in my opinion, to uh, avoid hoarding and stockpiling is more transparency and more communication, not less. More communication about what are the measures taken uh, in order to deal with this shortage. Because what we need to do is to build trust. That's very difficult, obviously, and, and uh, happily, to, um, to limit uh, media's influence. But if you give to the media concrete information about what's being done, um, in order to uh, to limit and to manage the shortage, um, it will create more trust uh, among patients about the fact that it won't last forever. And anyway, uh, the medicine is still available, even even in a restricted count quantities in some areas, etc. So I believe that we just need to uh, give more concrete information to the media. And um, I, I wanted to uh, come back to a point made by Ancela um, about so the perspective of uh, more obligations uh, for the industry, for instance, um, shortage prevention plans uh, or longer notification periods uh, in order to prevent shortages. And I truly believe this uh, needs to go together with uh, sanctions uh, in case of non-compliance. Not because we want industry to be sanctioned, but just because there are certainly a few lawyers among you and an obligation without any sanction is not an obligation because you just cannot enforce it. So you need, um, you need sanctions in the text and I hope we will find them in the pharma um, package uh, because if you don't have them, it's just impossible for the authorities to um, to implement them and make sure that they're respected. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. And that also reflects a point in terms of the communication from, um, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Ange from um, Alzheimer's Europe in terms of the, um, the interaction with patient and organizations in, and communication so that they're not left in the dark. So it's a, it's a common theme that goes through. Um, Sorry, may I interrupt one question on the sanctions? It should be clear who is the root cause. You can only sanct make sanctions to stakeholders which are the root cause. We had this example here that it was available in one city and not the other city. So should the marketing authorization holder, for instance, should be sanctioned only because the supply chain later on doesn't work. So we have to be very careful where we place the sanctions. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Ancela? Yes, no, but but of course, I mean, you have the so companies have the obligation to ensure that su so that supply meet demand. And in some situations, you might have start getting out of like stocks, which means that maybe, you know, in some pharmacies, because they themselves have some some stocks, the medicine is available, but not other pharmacies. I mean, there's a so I, I think also it's a bit the situation that, uh, described um, here in our survey. Thanks, Ancela. I saw a hand up pretty early on. Uh, sorry for getting... Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Martin Rodin Coverell from CPME. I actually wanted to ask a question uh, related to the last one. So two last answers partially covered this, but just to expand, um, I, I was wondering about the ac accountability question in relation to the to the supply of uh, me of uh, medicines, because indeed in the current version of the directive, we have the phrasing of the limits of the responsibility of the pharmaceuticals in the uh, ph pharmaceutical industry to supply medicines. So my question would be, 
how do we understand these limits of responsibility in terms of accountability? I asked the AI chat uh, just before actually raising my hand, what are the, who is accountable for the shortages? And uh, the chat said no one. Um, so so I just, I was wondering how do we understand this accountability issue actually in the, in the supply chain? And, and um, I would love to also ask questions on the communication, but I know that there's a separate session on that in the afternoon. So I think we can discuss that more. Uh, thank you. Is there any particular person or? I think mostly industry. Industry in terms of accountability. Stefan. Yeah, you mentioned it already. I would reference to the communication session the afternoon, if I may. And sorry, does that relate to the communication part or the accountability? The communication part for the accountability um, we mentioned in our presentation that the marketing authorization holder can be accountable and should be accountable until the release of a product to bring it to the market. But afterwards, when it's after the first economic customer, there's a very limited chance to even that the marketing authorization holder get knowledge where the product is. So it's a very good question on the accountability, which we may uh, elaborate further on. Thanks, Stefan. And I also think maybe that based on discussions from yesterday, it shows that, and as well as today, that accountability across all stakeholders um, is because it's also in terms of a collaborative approach. Go ahead from um, in the middle there, the lady behind. Sorry. Uh, Thank you, uh, Miriam. I'm a hospital pharmacist, and I'm very happy to see that a lot is being done on shortages, but I miss a key point. And that is, um, I've heard many times that notification was missing. Um, I can uh, tell you that's really true for us as healthcare professionals as well. But what is even scarcer is information on the extent or the duration of the shortage. And this is a big problem because we have a shortage and then we ask the manufacturing uh, or the, the supplier, when will it be available again? And they say, we don't know yet. And that really increases the anxiety of my patients because it's difficult to tell a patient, your drug is not here and I don't know when it will be back. But it also causes a snowball effect. We've seen that with the anti-epileptics and we've seen that with the low molecular weight heparins. Because if we don't know the extent, we don't know if the, we have to switch all of our patients or just a proportion of our patients. So if you want to prevent shortages, you need transparency on the current shortages, otherwise you cause even more shortages. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I'm just going to ask Maria to just comment on that one because the prevention side, uh, the document does raise these particular issues and it's, it, it's exactly for the points that you're talking about. Yes, thank you for the question. And, and in addition, um, as Darren has just said, there is a, um, a work uh, for um, uh, communication activities at national level. And this, uh, this, this activity will, will continue. I don't know if in the communication session this afternoon we will have um, something um, for for that, um, but um, it, it's it's true that uh, uh, the information for uh, information about uh, duration, uh, root cause, and alternatives is uh, undergoing is taken by thematic working group two, and, and 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 it's not a closed action, so there will be more information on, on that. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, all. I'm Amit Abushorkar, public health scientist from the Geneva Graduate Institute. So uh, we are working on uh, these issues uh, for a few uh, years, actually. My question, first question is to uh, George of uh, PGU. Uh, so uh, what we found that case to case, there is product specific or diagnostic specific supply chain issues. And it's mostly like inventory as well as R&D production, delivery and all this. So in your survey, have you had any chance to uh, inquire the epidemiological aspects of that. So why am I saying this? So while the shortages assessment is a real-time exercise, epidemiological modeling is a projection exercise. So disease profiling, coming back to the question uh, asked uh, um, my colleague. 
So disease profiling, age-wise profiling, that would give us a vantage point to understand and then accordingly uh, go for a precautionary measure. So have you had any chance? Because we are desperately searching for some ground information so that we can pull in and go for some bit of exercise. Thank you. And second, Maria, uh, I don't know, it may also overlap with the communication uh, event, uh, sorry, session. Uh, the rational usage of drugs, this is a very important thing, especially uh, as a, one of the strategies for uh, shortages, prevention of shortages. Uh, have you had any chance within the task force to discuss or what is the opinion of that in terms of? Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Indeed, in our survey, what we ask is from the community pharmacy perspective, what have been the shortages on medicines? And we can see a clear a pattern, a clear tendency from the previous years, cardiovascular medicines and central nervous system are always the one top ranked in, in, short, in short supply. There is not really linked through epidemiology modeling that I can assure that uh, that's not. Maybe it could be something to, to look upon. And especially with the, um, the type of data that you collect at community pharmacy level and also possible modeling uh, um, systems that, that can be implemented. Yes, that's for sure something that, that can be, uh, especially um, because then you need to, to give permission for, for example, for pharmacies to have access to electronic health records. So then you, you would have a, the information at the tip of your hands, let's say. So that's uh, certain, uh, some ideas that for sure can be explained. But I would say also that from the epidemiological point of view, and research institutes are very good uh, uh, in, in that field, they can also pinpoint that information and work in a collaborative network. For, for us, I think it's important, uh, most, uh, the most important fact is to have these as a collaborative approach. So the research, the epidemiology uh, intel, that can be uh, feedbacked um, either from the forecasting point of view, but also above everything to have communication through a central uh, tool between uh, the different stakeholders. Uh, blaming game doesn't reach us anywhere, but through communication and proactive uh, uh, um, enforcement, uh, yeah. that is the, the way that we can tackle shortages. Mario, do you want to comment on the rational use part of the question, the rational use of medicines? Um, for the rational use of medicines, um, I, I, I would like to clarify if it's um, in general or um, restriction of uh, supply when there are, when there are shortages uh, just to to make sure it's in general actually but yeah. of course for some disease specific i mean even in eu level also we are seeing that there are shortages in linked to the over medication even the question back to the antibiotic yeah for the for the rational use of medicines uh, um, this is also included in the uh, good um, the practices for healthcare professionals and and patients organizations and there is uh, the need to uh, to to raise awareness on the uh, right use of medicines so rational use of medicines and especially when there is a shortage um, this information is important to be uh, transmitted when there is a shortage um, for prescribers and for uh, patients, uh, for prescribers uh, to to use the rational use of medicines. And when there are uh, shortages, um, there is an interaction with healthcare professionals uh, to identify um, alternatives and how these uh, alternatives can be used, and and to have uh, guidances on 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 that develop guidances on on uh, an alternative safe use of medicinal products, and when there is a need to restrict the use of a specific uh, medicinal product, which is in shortage, uh, mm -hmm. the um, the patients uh, that um, may might be uh, prioritized. But I don't know if I replied to your question properly. Thanks, Maria. Go ahead. Could I come in on the rational use? Because um, from the veterinary perspective, this is extremely important, and this is a responsible and rational use, prudent use of all veterinary medicines is something that we have worked on 
for yeah for many 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 years um, not only on antimicrobials but also on other medicines and we have a European platform even on that one called Apruma the European platform for responsible use of veterinary medicines and in respect for antimicrobials this has also led together with a lot of other actions that we now reduced by 47 percent our use of uh, of antimicrobials in Europe. Um, but it also goes back to, to do the waste, the medicines that are not used in the uh, end disposal. And then we talk about packet sizes, for example, that are not too large, uh, but yeah, proper for the amount of medicines that the patients have. Thank you. Francois, I think, had your hand up a while ago. My question was uh, in alignment what was proposed um, recently. That was one of the things I was wondering, whether there is also thought about what measures can be made with all these medicines that are wasted because patients experience adverse effects or errors in efficacy and they have um, drugs at home and they cannot be reused if, under the current legislation. Are there thoughts about how we could change that? So is the question specific to anyone or would you like a general, it's, it's, it's an interesting topic. And yeah. so one of, okay, maybe I'll start on this side. Maria, is there anything that you'd like to say? I think this is national competence for, um, for this. Uh, it's also a difficulty, I think, from, uh, from tackling it from a shorter perspective because and, and I'm not discounting the fact that these medicines are already, let's say, dispensed out to patients or out into um, veterinary practice and things. And there's a complexity there. One point that maybe is what you might be touching on is maybe shelf life extension. Um, so, for example, then that would be bringing it back into industry to show, well, can you have industry, uh, shelf life extensions that would mean that the product isn't uh, past its shelf life earlier? Or is it the question more related to reuse of those products that are already in? Okay. Yeah, that 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 one. I unless anyone else wants to comment, I think that one is it is a more challenging one um, because it's dispensed. It has gone out to a patient or or a, a veterinary practitioner, and it's very difficult to bring that back in in a non crisis situation. Let's say um even at that because of safety of the storage conditions and things like that that's that that means it's challenging um i accept the point but i think it's a challenging one and um, but it is also a national competency um perspective but i don't think that's that legislation will allow that anytime soon per so i'm per trank from iqvia most probably know what IQV is, but for the rest, we are the typical data company and a lot involved in analysis of data. We're also actually the biggest performer of clinical trials in the world. Um, I have a few reflections, having worked on this field for a while. First of all, uh, we talked about more transparency, and I can tell you that we have today a database with uh, uh, all shortages in 25 countries here. And the level of quality of how the information is filled in, for example, end dates or causes for it, uh, uh, is actually quite low. Uh, transparency of those type of things is needed, and the transparency is also needed to force the manufacturers to fill it in better. From your prevention part, there's two things that I was missing here. One is this of forecasting what demand will be. And uh, my question to you is, who do you really see responsible for that? And I especially ask the question, if it's a multi-source uh, a, a product, who is responsible for uh, doing it? And then I say, if I take Denmark, it's hard for a Swede to say that Denmark is really, really good. But they're really good on forecasting and notifying the industry that demand is shifting on something and have the industry to respond back and say, can we meet it or not? And Denmark actually have the lowest level of shortages in Europe and the shortest resolution time. 
So I think that's an important part. And then I have to give credit to my Norwegian friends at the uh, Audungen company here, because they push very hard for having a Nordic pack or multi-country packs, because the, uh, you were afraid of parallel trade. But at the very moment you have multi-country packs, it's very easy, both for the manufacturer already, uh, but also for traders here to shift between countries to uh, 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 fill short-term uh, needs. So uh, two more to your list, and, and what, what's your comment to those two? Uh, thank you for, for your questions. So for, uh, I will start with the second one. I think it's easier. <laughs> so uh, multi-country uh, packs are, are, are available, and there's a CMDH guide. And, and these, uh, active, these uh, multi-country packs are seen as uh, one of the solutions of shortages, and we have received several comments um, for, for that. Um, so uh, yes, this is uh, something um, uh, that is raised, and is one of the um, possible solutions uh, to facilitate uh, management of shortages and to redistribute uh, stocks among uh, countries easily and quickly. Um, for uh, for the forecast demand, I mean um, demand the marketing. I, I'm not going who, uh, to say who is accountable, but uh, the marketing authorization holder has the uh, full the, the overview, the the whole oversight of the uh, um, demand, uh, the uh, and and they can identify um, early signals when when they. Sorry, go ahead. No, but is that true? Uh, uh, if you have generated competition and you have eight companies in the market coming in and out, you, they have no, no clue of what the totality is uh, happening. Yeah, no, and that's, uh, for that it's important to, uh, to have early communication when there is early signals uh, because uh, it, it allows uh, um, early uh, activities to address shortages. So when we are, or regulators are aware of uh, specific trends and of increase of demand of, of a specific uh, medicinal products, then if we have, if we receive uh, timely communication, then uh, we have the uh, tools to um, interact with uh, all the stakeholders involved, not, not only the uh, medicines that might be in, in short, but also with the with the alternatives and and try to facilitate the increase of manufacturing or try to find other solutions to to address shortages. Yeah. I see that there's hands up online as well. So this is our first online intervention. Uh, Giorgio, I think from Tiva Pharmaceuticals, wants to contribute. Uh, yes, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, I would like just to uh, go back to the transparency and communication because uh, I hear uh, many times uh, to mention these points, but uh, I think that uh, uh, also within this group that is, uh, uh, I would say, representing a lot of uh, very knowledgeable people, we are still uh, using uh, uh, a way of communication that is not fully transparent, uh, as, at least for me. Um, starting from uh, the need uh, to have clear definitions, uh, first of all, because uh, I hear uh, uh, talking about critical medicines uh, and then critical shortages. I don't understand what is a critical shortage. Is a shortage of a critical medicine or is a shortage of a medicine uh, that uh, for any reason is considered critical. Um, we should need uh, clear methodologies uh, behind the clear definitions. For example, uh, for the critical medicines, uh, we go from uh, the WHO extent uh, where we have uh, a very super precise definition of critical medicines uh, arriving to the strength level of a specific medicine and then uh, European definitions that are instead looking at two therapeutic areas that are covering, I would say, the 70% of the medicines we have on the market. Um, 
we should need the consistent messages. Uh, yesterday uh, at the opening session, uh, uh, Sylvain mentioned that um, uh, we need uh, a critical medicine list in order to assure that uh, we can run on these medicines risk management uh, assessment to uh, identify vulnerabilities and work on prevention. And then this morning, uh, instead, uh, into the presentation of uh, Maria Jesus on, on the network strategy, uh, we see prevention plan and management plan um, just reported uh, into the prevention and mitigation of any shortage. Uh, Last but not least, uh, we need also to be uh, very consistent in the approach because um, if uh, we start from the assumption that uh, we need to run assessments uh, for uh, the prevention and the mitigation of risks, uh, we need also to allow the flexibility to the industry to define the best way to address the vulnerabilities. Instead of what we see is that, that we are talking about uh, uh, risk management assessment, and then we are talking about uh, stockpiling and inventory, and then we are talking about... <laughs> Giorgio, I don't think that you're still with us online. I feel that we need a little bit more transparency. Thank you, George. <laughs> <laughs> we lost you for a second. So if you hear laughing, that's that's the reason, not at the points. You talked uh, a lot of the points, uh, especially in the first part, were um, were addressed yesterday as well in terms of critical medicines and things like that. So um, I'm going to ask Monica to respond to that aspect. Yes, thank you, uh, thank you, and uh, and George, I was hoping that yesterday we we clarified the the difference between the the lists, the various lists of critical medicines. We understand that this is something that we need to continue to communicate so that that is clear to all. So we have a list of uh, critical medicines for a crisis, so crisis specific lists of medicines, because we have two ongoing public health emergencies. We have one list of critical medicines for COVID and one list of critical medicines. Uh, for monkeypox. In terms of uh, the reporting requirements uh, for the medicines included, included in these two lists, they are clearly defined in the regulation. The process is ongoing and we are collecting information from, on one hand, uh, industry, on the other hand, from national content authorities. Now, as a follow-up from uh, the EC Pharma strategy, and in particular the structure dialogue and the initiative of developing a list uh, of critical medicines at EU level. So that work will continue uh, uh, in the context of the activities of the HMA EMA task force. So there we're trying to define a common list of critical medicines in the EU that are uh, to be used in peacetime, as well as some will cover crisis. Uh, and there we'll see what will be the requirements uh, for or policy measures to put in place to ensure continuous availability of those medicines. So I, I wanted to clarify also you refer to what is a critical shortage. So this is something that we've been uh, handling uh, now for uh, more than three years at the level of the SPOC working party. And we have a definition of what is a, a critical shortage. So a critical shortage can affect uh, in effect, any medicinal product. Uh, so this is a situation where there is no alternative available for that particular uh, medicine. So that will become a critical shortage. And uh, we have handled those critical shortages uh, at the level of the SPOC Working Party uh, for a number of years. And uh, more recently, and yesterday, uh, uh, Tony Amfrens referred to, for instance, the critical shortages we've seen of thrombolytics and antibiotics. So I just wanted to set the scene again on the various lists of critical medicines and what uh, we understand as a, a critical shortage and uh, how it's important for us then to have uh, put in place a number of uh, EU coordinated measures in such situations. But uh, I'll give the floor back to Darren, perhaps to address the other elements that you referred to in relation to, to the guidance on prevention of shortages. So in the first instance, I think I'd, I'd just ask 
Marie, if she'd like to answer anything on that because of the presenting that that particular aspect and no, I'm thinking. So in relation to things like um, I think you mentioned stockpiling measures and stuff like that, that that's a difficult one. I think um, whilst it does have the potential to um, increase the immediate need, there are challenges also in terms of the national stockpiling um, because it does meet an immediate need if there's a shortage, but if it's a global issue, those reserves run out as well. So it doesn't fundamentally get to a point in time, but it does help um, in some instances, especially when there's difficulties getting stock through. There was a mention earlier in the chat about a product called Rivetrol. That's a controlled drug. So the controlled drugs have more challenges moving through because of import and export licenses. So it helps mit mitigate the impact of, of shortage in certain situations. Um, but it is something that could challenge a supply, a fluidity of supply in general. So it's something that needs to be considered, I think, on the main. We had another hand up um, from earlier. Go ahead there in the middle. Yeah, Michael Amish from German GKV Switzerland. Since we, I wanted to, to touch upon the point that has been raised repeatedly now that we lack transparency on where drugs are and how they can be distributed and maybe highlight a discussion that has been started in Germany regarding this one. We've got the directive on falsified medicines, which in principle allows us to track medicines through the systems, from the customer to the moment when they leave the pharmacy or are given to the last customer, to the patient. So if this system could be used, we at least would have transparency how much medicines are in the market and where they are. So if we've got some regional wrong distribution or we've got some bottleneck, we could even use the system for detecting higher demands on the one end, which is not satisfied by additional medicines given to the system. So I think we could also put this into the discussion and see whether this could be used European-wide. Thanks, Mikhail. I, that was suggestions that came up, Maria, in the um, in the document, the, ta the prevention document. Um, and there will be specific points to address that. Um, did you want to give a highlight of, of those at the moment? Yes, thank you, Darren. Uh, yes, as, as Darren mentioned, we received comments um, regarding the use of the EMBS um, to monitor shortages. Uh, but uh, as, as the legislation is now, um, it, it's not foreseen. Uh, it, the, the, the monitoring of shortages is not possible at, at this moment. Um, and this is uh, up to the uh, Commission for, for deciding the next steps. Yeah. Go ahead there, you had your hand up for a while, and then I'll move to uh, Marco online after. Um, okay, thank you. Um, Bear Elmer, re uh, representing the European Specialist Nurses. <clears throat> uh, I want to refer to a case some years ago when there was a shortage on a domain on rheumatology, and one of the patients went to the online illegal market and they found uh, medication exactly the same and after after a while with a huge relapse with great shame the patient said well we bought it illegally and there was no any uh, any affection substance in it so i wonder if you were if you're talking about the shortage how this also affect the uh, the falsified or the illegal uh, uh, market so because when there is shortage there is also um, uh, legal aspect as this is this also in, within the within the <clears throat> scope of the marketing uh, and, and the EMA I'm going to speak from my agency's perspective the in the Irish aspect but I know it's reflected in others as well when there's a shortage particularly of something that's going to be uh, and in most cases it's most people it, it's their medicine so it's a motive for them it's something that they need but we do engage with our enforcement colleagues um, to look to, to make sure if there's any additional activities online to try and see because these are exactly situations like for example historically with oncology medicine that they can trigger people to move into the, the legal space but it is something that's actively worked on by most medicine, all medicine agencies because of the, the, the impact that it has. Um, Marco is online, Marco from FBI, would you like to talk, speak? Yes, uh, thank you. So I just wanted to briefly raise uh, a few points. Um, thank you for the interesting discussion. I mean, all these points come from the discussions we are having, which is absolutely fruitful, I would say. 
um, on multi-market packs, uh, that's definitely something we are we are pursuing more and more. Uh, however, there is a rate limiting step there at the moment, which is the uh, national language labeling requirements. So if we can look in the future into uh, making electronic product information and um, patient leaflet electronic, that definitely opens the door for more uh, clustering of markets and that will definitely help in case we need to manage um, any shortage in the in the future. So we need to leverage a little bit more on the digital side of things. Uh, and on the digital side of things is also something that can help us with um, uh, better visibility of demand. Honestly, I've seen in the chat, uh, Adrian has been raising the use of EMBS data. It was raised also in the audience by the gentleman Michael uh, uh, before. So definitely data is available in the ecosystem. That data can be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we need to we need to understand, you know, what are, uh, you know, how can we use that data in a, in a, in a, in a compliant matter? But definitely we should look more into uh, how we can use data available in the ecosystem. FPA is actually uh, running a project at the moment in uh, looking at how only the manufacturer's data contained in the EMBS uh, can help to strengthen strengthen or digital uh, processes and reporting uh, versus uh, versus um, uh, authorities. And a final comment on sanctions. Uh, I just want to make sure those sanctions are a sort of fit for purpose and proportionate because there are already a lot of sanctions around to be honest i want to give very quickly a real life example of what it means trying to step in to help on a shortage uh, we had a shortage driven by a demand increase of course manufacturers were going out of stock one after the other and then we step in for help this already means an extra cost for a company when they are stepping in to help but of course we're going to do that and now the risk is that actually we will need to pay a clawback on that help that we are providing. So you can understand there are several things in the system that need to work together uh, to, uh, to, to allow a swift response. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think the point is about sanctions, to be honest, because uh, going into a shortage, it's already a very painful and uh, expensive experience for a manufacturer, not only in terms of uh, of uh, economics, but also in terms of quality and complexity that needs to be managed. So definitely <laughs> manufacturers would like to avoid more and more shortages, but we need to devise solutions which are future proof. So we don't need to address these issues with uh, old solutions like uh, stockpilings uh, everywhere, for example, that's not, or, or in increasing the bill of sanctions. That's not going to help. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Marco. And I think you're outlining the the need for continued collaboration and in terms of responses and, and and aspects that we've been talking about um, between today and yesterday. But Jorge, you wanted to respond. Yeah, thank you very much. Regarding the uh, EMVS, so the, the European Medicines Verification System, and PGU as a founding member of EMVO, the European Medi Medifications, uh, Medicines Verification Organization, the FMD system cannot be used as a monitoring of shortages. It's, it's not a full track and trace um, uh, system. It's an end-to-end. -end. So it, it doesn't, doesn't give a, a reliable picture of a medicine at any given time. So that's why we believe this is not a suitable system to prevent shortages. Uh, because not a full track and trace, but from end to end. That was just how I wanted to comment and to clarify this. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, um, particularly from a, a veterinary perspective in response to the, the query that was raised earlier. Yeah, I just wanted to back up what was said earlier. We have to keep an eye also on the legal market. And I will give a, a, a very uh, an example on that one. Um, one of the products on the essential list or the critical list, I have to say, I'm sorry, I'm using the the, the wrong term terminology for COVID is remdesivir, and remdesivir is used for COVID, but is also used to treat a, a deadly disease in cats. And because it's placed on this um, list, this critical list, in several member states, they decided it would no longer be available for the treatment of, of cats. 
with as a result that veterinarians didn't have any products anymore available for, to treat this deadly disease and so had to euthanize these cats. That was the only solution. What was the result? Well, they say the internet was invented for cat videos, but it seems to be also invented for illegal cat medicine. And now we have a huge illegal uh, platform uh, delivering, yeah, products to, to treat this deadly disease. So, yeah, we have to be careful. Thank you. Casper, uh, you've had your hand up for a while. Thank you very much. Uh, just returning to, to the um, draft guidance um, and comments from our sector, uh, we represent the parallel distributors in Europe. And uh, we, of course, took note of, of, of recommendation 10 on, on looking at export um, in cases of shortages. And as you know very well, we, we agree that uh, exports should never be a cause or, or exacerbate shortages. What we are missing uh, very much in, in the guidance is, is actually the whole aspect of how we use imports to alleviate shortages. This is something done every day. We know that nine out of 10 shortages is national uh, or only in a few countries at a time. So, so it's, it's actually something that can really be utilized in a lot of situations. Um, and uh, we are quite uh, concerned that it's not taken up more at, at this level because this is the right level to take it up when we collaborate between each other. Um, we also have some questions in relation to when authorities go in and take different measures in relation to uh, exports where they, where they identify a risk. Are you actually notifying the importing country authorities that you're doing it? Because that's the earliest notification possible. There is a wide range of products where parallel imports are the sole suppliers in the import markets, often because of commercial withdrawals, but where we continue to do parallel import. Um, so are you actually notifying as an exporting member state, the importing member state, uh, that, that you are now taking measures? That is the earliest notification uh, you can have because you know what action you're taking before we do. Um, so that's something where I would like to see a little bit of reflection also on the authorities' role in, in, in that work. Um, we have uh, many such examples. Um, then um, I just wanted to also comment on the European Medicines Verification Organization, as Jorge correctly said, and, and I think it goes back a bit to the multi-market. It is indeed the system is an end-to-end -end verification system. That means we don't know where the actual pack is at a given moment. And the last uh, figures I received uh, as, as a member of EMBO was 18% of all packs are multi-market packs. That means in principle they are uploaded to different national systems and actually we don't know if it's then in system one, two or three. So whether it's in Denmark, Sweden or Norway at that given point in time. So it's just to try and give you a little bit of a taste why it's not so simple to use an end-to-end -end verification system for that. If we can use parts of the data uh, for example, to see how much have manufacturers actually in total in Europe put on the market. We think that's very, very useful. Uh, we think actually that's an aspect we are missing in general when we talk about prevention of shortages. We tend to go into national silos uh, and, and, and protect our own markets, but no one is really looking. Is Europe as a total supplied what Europe needs to be supplied? Um, and, and that's really something where we think potentially uh, there could be uh, data available out there. So that would be our comments uh, and I would like to hear your reflection especially on, on the use of parallel import uh, as, a, as an alleviation of shortages. Thank you for the, the points. Um, Maria, would you like to address uh, some of the points there um, as they relate to the document and also just to reflect that the, the comments that um, affordable medicines have presented and suggestions they will be responded to directly as well. Yes, so we will reply and, and we acknowledge your, your comments uh, during the uh, consultation, during the, the, the written uh, consultation. Uh, so the, um, uh, the reflections uh, here, the, we know that uh, sometimes uh, import uh, alleviate uh, shortages. And, and this is a, 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 also a possibility for regulators to uh, manage uh, shortages, um, but it's not in, included in, uh, in in our guidance. And, and for imports also, uh, we would like to stress 
to highlight the importance of communication with uh, other um, international um, regulators and partners um, due to the uh, global dimension of uh, the of the of the shortages and the communication that is or, uh, always in place uh, to address that. Thank you, Maria. And I'm just acknowledging that there's also um, counterpoints in the chat about the use of the EMVS data as well, just to, just for transparency. Charlotte, go ahead. Just wanted to come back briefly on the question of sanctions and critical medicines. So on the question of sanctions, um, so in France, um, they have been in place for a few years now. And we have um, between one and three sanctions a year, uh, a few thousand euros each time. So I don't think there is a real threat for industry there. And especially because, um, so these sanctions are related to specific obligations. Industry is never sanctioned because there is a shortage. Industry sanctioned because they did not respect their obligation in terms of notification. Uh, they did not prepare uh, a shortage mitigation plan in time, or they did not res uh, respect their stock obligation. So that's very precise. And most companies obviously are never fined because they uh, respect the rules. So sanctions are just in place in order to force everybody to respect the rules. So that's a, a very well-known principle. And as regards critical medicines, um, I, I think we need to be clear about the fact that uh, the list uh, of critical medicines, uh, which will be drafted at European level in order to, um, to, to in I mean, to uh, protect the safety of supply and to increase the safety of supply should only be used for that purpose. And as regards a uh, notification obligation, as regards the preparation of a uh, shortage prevention plans, this needs to be done for all medicines and not only for a restricted number of medicines. Just, just give you a very a very concrete example. So in France, we have a list of medicines of high therapeutic interest. That's a rather broad list because it's about 40% of all available medicines in France. Still, paracetamol is not on this list. We've had a huge uh, problem of, of supply issue, shortage of paracetamol and ibuprofen uh, recently. And, um, and that's something crucial for patients. And I think we all understand that. So that's something uh, which needs to, and, and I heard industry, and they, I'm very glad about it, um, saying that they want to be more um, patient-centered. So listen to our request, please. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. I'm also conscious of the time. So um, Paddy and then Josie. Uh, thank you, Darren. Patrick Hostel, Europa Bio. Um, and maybe a question for Maria. Um, and I certainly w welcome the kind of shortage definition that we've got at the moment, but is there any consideration of kind of extending to a unit of measure um, so that we're putting in place all these initiatives to manage shortages? How do, we ma how do we begin to measure success? So if I, you know, say my company shorts Germany for three months and I short Cyprus for one month, we're counting those as one for one. How do we begin to be more patient centric in that definition to, you know, take into consideration the impact on the patient population being treated? Um, so certainly would work, would value any, any further discussion on that extension of that definition to include a unit of measure. And then just in terms of um, visibility and transparency, if we look across the Atlantic, our FDA have a, a shortage app. Ha has that been considered and maybe... That's a way of being able to pull data from all the national registries into one central system would be of value to industry, but also, I'm sure, to, to healthcare providers and, and to patients as well. And then whatever we can do in relation to reporting, uh, we all understand our requirements uh, in terms of, of shortage reporting. Uh, at a first centrally authorised product, we've got to report into two different systems. If it's manufacturing or QD related, there's a third notification. We have to report to all impacted member states uh, often that requires to the National Competent Authority and the Ministry for Health. So whatever we can do to get the information in quicker um, is what we're trying to facilitate. But at the moment, we have so many different reporting requirements. It's um, 
it's quite it's slowing the process down thank you thanks patrick okay wants to respond thank you and i fully understand your your comment but on the other end uh, only one patient without a medicine is a shortage for us so we need to be careful trying to rank i know cyprus is a smaller market germany is a bigger market but be careful on that oh no sorry just just to qualify I, i was saying maybe you know we short a market for one one month per hundred thousand of population so you'd be able to get you know that particular shortage i reported to germany would be 30 units whereas in Cyprus, it would be one unit. I totally take your point. Every shortage has to be counted. But how do you give that differentiator an impact? Do you want to respond to anything? For, for shortages, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, the, uh, we will take all shortages as, the, as, main, as equally important, uh, regardless of the population impacted. Um, I have to say that there is an ongoing uh, discussion at the Spoke Working Party working on the practicalities uh, for, for shortages, and, and this will be, um, yeah, and, and this is also linked to the um, revision of the pharma legislation. Uh, and regarding the, your comment for the FDA uh, shortages application, um, I just uh, wanted to, um, to inform you that uh, we are working on uh, extending the, um, the shortage catalog and the criteria to publish uh, information um, on that and, and working on in transparency and um, uh, making available uh, more information so uh, on on shortages that are um, dealt by by the spoke working party and and also the MSSD. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Ansela. Yes, thank you. I just want to go back to a comment that Marco made about electronic product information, and of course, we we think this is in general it can be a very valuable tool and more specifically in cases of shortage where countries have to import medicines um, medicine packages in other languages but we think that the, the the question of shortages should not be used as an excuse to get rid of the paper leaflets across the board because paper leaflets are still the easiest way for consumers to access information on the right use of the of the medicine and not everyone will be able to use qr codes and i think this is something important that we have to take into account as well Thank you, Angela. Josie. Josie. Thank you, Josie Dreppwell, PCWP, IPOPI. Um, yesterday, Tony Humphreys men mentioned one sentence and it stuck with me. He said, stop online sales. And it is remarkable that now you can go, during a shortage of amoxicillin, you can go online and buy it online. How on earth are we going to stop that? And do we even know whether it is amoxicillin or is it just powder or whatever but there must be a way of stopping because they have barcodes etc so where are we going Josie that's a huge topic <laughs> <laughs> no small question to land on it's a huge topic that a lot of uh, industry member states are trying to tackle it's, it's a huge problem and you're right invariably it's not actually the product um, it's something else. So uh, <laughs> I don't have an answer for you. I don't know if anyone has a silver bullet here, no. <laughs> but it is something that is that is actively being worked on. It's a challenge. It's a constant challenge that, that does affect us because ultimately it goes back to, and what we're all saying here is a patient-centered approach um, and, and the safety of, of that perspective as well is, is taken into account. I'm very conscious of the time, um, so maybe two more, if that's okay, um, but bearing in mind you're eating into your own coffee time. Um, go ahead. Yeah, Thomas Porsner, uh, representing GERB, um, European Full Line Wholesale Distribution uh, Association. Uh, I just wanted to add an argument to Casper and to Hoge. Um, we're just talking about RX products if you talk uh, about the EMVS. So this is an additional argument. You don't talk about all uh, uh, pharmaceuticals uh, in the system. And we don't have to track and trace. We just have an end-to-end -end, uh, verification system. So these data are, aren't useful for this issue. Um, I just wanted to respond to Charlotte uh, and uh, support her arguments. Even if sanctions are the last measurement taken, uh, we need measurements 
uh, to improve and to enforce the public service obligations because there is a public service obligation for two of us. These are pharmaceutical industry and marketing authorization holders and these are the uh, pharmaceutical wholesalers. So we need an enforcement and we need the right to be supplied at wholesalers because this isn't implemented in the, uh, in the European uh, legislation. We have it in Germany. It is even a, a declarative uh, a, a, a law. It is, it is not enforceable for us, so we're asking our government to make it enforceable. So we, uh, we need for uh, fulfilling the public service obligation as wholesalers a right to be supplied by the industry. And then we can talk about if there are justified quotas or that there are unjustified quotas because we are the first ones uh, who uh, are acknowledging if there's a quota by setting up by the pharmaceutical industry and the manufacturer. And so we are uh, seeing if there's a quota and there's a shortage or is it not a shortage? It's just taking another way of supply chain. And that's why you need the data of the pharmacist too to see if it's really a shortage, if the uh, 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 direct supply to the pharmacist is just uh, going uh, around uh, a wholesaler and uh, there is a shortage on the wholesale side, but there's no shortage on the pharmacist side. So you have to have these all this data of the whole supply chain to see uh, if there's a shortage in your kind. And for us, we are willing to be transparent on this point. And uh, that's why, Maria, I'm not so happy about your approach to say this is an industry perspective. And you, uh, because uh, I'm a, a former legal person, you have to be in the forms of Article 81, 2001, 83. So you have marketing authorization holders, you have the public service obligation of pharmaceutical wholesalers, and you have the pharmacists on the other hand. So uh, put your point of view of uh, who has to be uh, and to make which uh, prevention plans and plans and measurements on the different uh, parts of the supply chain, as you say. But the industry approach you've taken overall is for uh, our point of view, uh, not the right one. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think there's a couple of points that you're echoing in terms of the generality of the discussions, transparency, communication, and, and the points right across the supply chain. I, I would also maybe mention that that document is one document as part of a portfolio of, of uh, best practice guidance and, and initiatives that are being taken into account. Your, your point about sanctions is also well made. We have time for maybe one more. Go ahead, Diem. So Veronique Davos for, for HBR. Um, I have heard a lot about new requirements, uh, sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think you are all happy with the medicinal product that we are putting on the market. So my, my question is for the, for the industry that is uh, actually uh, fulfilling all, the, all these uh, requirements for supply, etc. I didn't hear about any incentive. Do you have any idea of uh, any in incentive we, we could get? Because, okay, there are shortages. I, I agree with that. It's, it is a pain for us when we have a shortage uh, due to everything we have to do, but that would be a double pain. But what about the 99% that are doing well, actually, and are delivering uh, to our supply? So that was one point. Second point concerning um, EMVS and the, and the use of the data here. I agree. It's an end-to-end system. Absolutely. I agree. It is for prescription product. We are talking here about a shortage of critical medicinal products, if I hear well. Uh, those are prescription products. So if, uh, I mean, most of them. So if we, for, um, we, we could at least handle uh, and, and could see trends uh, thanks to the data that are in the system currently. I mean, we are not inventing anything here. It is only to use the data that are existing. If thanks to this data, we could know um, and have some trends where the patient is actually needed because end-to-end, -end, that means from industry back to the patient. So if we could see where the patient are using this, um, uh, all, all the packs, etc., we could establish some trend and know well in advance uh, where there is a need to, to supply. And if we think of the recent uh, shortage on antibiotics, for instance, we would have known, like, two or three months earlier uh, than it is uh, actually um, uh, written and that we hear about it, 
And we could have anticipated that. And so for industry, as you know, planning is essential because you cannot produce in a day. So you need to do all the production, the control, the release, and so on and so on. So, but it takes, it takes time. So the more in advance we are aware of where there could be a gap, the more we can prepare and anticipate. And so this is why uh, all these uh, data are absolutely, and the trend are, um, are needed, especially for, for demand. And last thing, we are doing a lot of reporting, uh, as, as um, it was mentioned by Patrick, several reporting systems. So we are all managing those, whether they are centralized product nationally, etc. We, we are doing all this um, reporting and sometimes duplicating the same information, etc. A lot of information is provided to the regulatory authority. Um, I think they are all in different formats and so on, so that we are giving a lot of uh, data no information is going back. Uh, I, I mean by that there is no analysis because I think the data is not harmonized or so. Or the, I, I don't know if we should have a drop down list or something so that all the info we are giving to regulators could be analyzed better. We could have better communication. And, and again, it is all a matter of uh, anticipation. So if we could better communicate all to the, uh, together, to, we can yeah, prevent and work in advance. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that you're highlighting again the issue of communication and transparency and the information flows. I think your points are, are made well. Um, early notification is essential. Ansela pointed it out. Transparency, communication, all of the speakers um, pointed it out as well. Um, because it gives everybody an opportunity to, to, to respond to a situation. Just in relation to things like incentives, we're regulatory bodies. There's not a lot of things that we can look at where we can, we do, but um, I'll leave that to others that, that would be better off place to respond to it. Um, and then I, I actually just wanted to end on that point in terms of the communication and transparency. At the end of the day, everybody does want to get a medicine to patients. Patients need it, pharmacists need it to give it, doctors all the way right up the supply chain. Everybody has a role in this. Everybody does want to get medicines there. It's making sure that where there are shortages that they're going to be prevented if they can or mitigated the impact on patients is, is the key thing here and um, so it's always a patient-centered approach um, and then reiterating that communication and transparency of information flow so on that point i think we'll take a break maybe for uh, what's been quite a long session and um, thank you very much to all of the panelists and thank you to everyone that's contributed online as well as in person um, thanks very much